May 2nd, 2008. It doesn't feel that long ago. But it's been 11 years since the birth of something special. The birth of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And the start of what would become the Infinity Saga. And over the next 11 years, we would have 22 more films like this. One epic story that would define a generation in comic book films. Then on April 25th, 2019, we witnessed the end game. And as the days passed, end game continued to break records ultimately becoming the highest grossing film of all time, surpassing Avatar. Why am I here? I'm here to don the Quantum Realm suit one last time. To watch all the films. And then I will rank them. Which film was the worst? Which film was the best? I'll rank them, whatever it takes. By the end of this year, I will have the biggest ranking video I've done to date, as I rank every single Marvel Cinematic Universe film in the Infinity Saga. Stay tuned. Because this is the end game. And there we are, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow Marvel and comic book fans. The day has finally come. The day has finally come to rank every single Marvel Cinematic Universe film. A day I never thought would happen, but it has regardless. So, here we go, 23 films from worst to best. Where do we even begin? Well, all I'll say is, there will be no restrictions on spoilers for this. So if you haven't seen any of the Marvel Cinematic Universe films, you have been warned. So, 23 films over 11 years. Starting with Iron Man and climaxing with Spider-Man Far From Home. Now, at time of recording, the Marvel Cinematic Universe has grossed $22.4 billion at the box office. So, I'm not going to waste any more time. We 
let's get started. I will try and say some good points about the films, even the ones that I rank low. So, here we go. I have the rankings in front of me. The rankings are just my opinion. And this is also going to be my, uh, my last video of the year. And then it's back to business after New Year. So. You can let me know what your rankings are. In the comments. So here we go. Number 23. It is for the Dark World. Now, cliche choice, I know, but a lot of fans have criticized the film. And it's easy to see why. It's easy to see why it is down there as one of, if not the weakest film of the MCU. A 66% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. The consensus from the website saying it may not be the finest film to come from the Marvel Universe, but For the Dark World still offers plenty of the humour and high stakes action that fans have come to expect. Metacritic, with a Metacritic had a score of fifty-four for the for the film out of forty-four reviews, indicating mixed or average reviews. Cinema Score giving it an A minus. Ben Child from the Guardian, thanks to Hiddleston and Hemsworth's impressive collective charisma. For the Dark World is far from a franchise killer. So yeah, that's um, a lot of a lot of the critics have said some positive things about it, but nevertheless, <clears throat> for me. There's not much that's very, there's not much that's memorable about the film. But Thor teams up with Loki in this film to save the Nine Realms from the, the Dark Elves led by the vengeful Malekith, or Malekith however you pronounce it. So in this film, present day Asgard, we've got Loki imprisoned for his war crimes on Earth. A lot of that down to the first Avengers film. We have an army. We have a Hulk. <laughs> I think I, I think I might quite like that drink now. I mean, <sighs> Tom Hiddleston as Loki, he's, he's the best part of the Thor universe. Then you've got Natalie Portman back as Jane Foster, with her intern this time, Darcy Lewis, travelling to, travel to an abandoned factory. And you've got these portals that appear. And the portals are linked to the Nine Realms. The Asgardians soon learn... Throughout this film, that well, this is in 
I'm a bit all over the place here, bear with me. Asgardians soon learn that the convergence, a rare alignment of the Nine Realms, is imminent. And as the events approaches, portals linking the worlds appear at random. And that's basically what happens throughout this film. It's stopping this event from happening. Thor returning to Asgard at the end of the film, declining Odin's off offer to take the throne, and tells him of Loki's sacrifice, Loki sacrificing himself to sacrificing himself to help Thor to help Thor save the day. Loki sacrifices himself. How does he get killed? He gets killed uh, by Algrim who fatally wounds him. Man, that seems tough to stomach. Who's gonna deliver the who's gonna deliver the smart comedic wit now, now that Loki's gone? But but like I say, there's not much else there's not much that's really memorable about the film, apart from me going through the plot of the film. And that's is Thor the Dark World at number 23. Number 22 now, it's The Incredible Hulk. This is the only one, interestingly, that doesn't have the actor that originally played him in the film as part of the Avengers lineup. Now, how is this Incredible Hulk film connected to the MCU? Iron Man makes a cameo appearance in this film. Because this film came out at the same time, roughly, as the first Iron Man film. June 13th, to be exact. About six weeks after the first Iron Man film came out. And at the end of the day, who would have thought? Who would have thought this would be a sign of things to come? Now, I'm not sure what, what happened behind the scenes to cause Edward Norton to no longer be able to portray um, Hulk. This is another one of those ones that's very forgettable. I will give, I will give it this though. I will give it this though. The fact that they didn't waste much time telling us on how Bruce Banner became the Incredible Hulk. They did that. Through the tight, through the um, opening credits, which I will give them credit for. I will give them credit for that. But that's about it. I have to criticise it though, because it's one of those cases of, um, okay, so that's how it happened. Uh, couldn't they have at least spent the first 10, 15 minutes of the film doing that? I mean, that's how most origin stories work. But yeah, there's not much else I can say on that, apart from my man making a cameo appearance. Um, box office wasn't that great. And uh, Mark Ruffalo was uh, put in to uh, take over and has been the Incredible Hulk since then. Who knows what could have... Who knows what could have happened? Number 21, Thor. 
the very first four. Oh, goody, goody gumdrops. Now, where to begin with this one? Again, Tom Hiddleston as Loki. Great casting choice. Setting things up brilliantly for things to come in the first Avengers film. I mean, the only, the only scene I can think of that's really memorable about the film is uh, when you've got Thor in, when you've got Thor in the coffee shop, and he's like, oh, oh, this is good, what's this? Uh, Jane Foster's like, yada yada, another, and smashes the glass, and you're just like, that is just brilliant. So this is how it's. So this is how it is. It's um, the start of the film. You've got Thor banished to Earth from Asgard, stripped of his powers and his hammer Mjolnir. Mjolnir, sorry. After reigniting a dormant war, as his brother Loki plots to take the Asgardian throne from Odin, Thor must prove him. Thor must prove himself worthy of Mjolnir. Now, the reception. Let's have a look and see how well it did. 77% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Much better than... Much better than Dark World. And then you've got... You've got, um, you've got one critic saying, as far as, you've got one of the critics saying, with, the, blah, can't get my words out, Quinn's Earthworth, Quinn's Hemsworth in the title role, he praised that a lot, saying Thor is the most entertaining superhero debut since the original Spider-Man back in 2002. And who'd have thought we'd, who'd have thought we'd have to see a sign of things to come? But again, like I say, not really much. Not really much else I can say. Apart from that, apart from that one coffee scene. Number twenty, we've got Iron Man three, and oh boy, fans were living over this one. Why? Well, you've got. Robert Downey Jr. back as Tony Stark, trying to find out who this Mandarin is. Now, the Mandarin, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. And you've also got, you've also got, um, Don Cheadle as Rhodes or War Machine. Ben Kingsley. And you've got Ben Kingsley as the Mandarin.
it was more the way the Mandarin was revealed that fans really hated. And it's easy to see why. Because that, that was what this whole film was built around. On top of the fact that Stark was suffering from the suffering from PTSD or whatever it was. Uh, from what happened in the first Avengers film. After trip into space to take out the alien ships to ensure that uh, New York was safe. Falls back to Earth, crashes down hard and he's, uh, he's having trouble sleeping as well. Next up, you've got Iron Man 2, and oh boy. Uh, Iron Man 2. So, this was the third film in what would become the Marvel Cinematic Universe, two years after the first film was released and here you've got Stark resisting calls by the US government to hand over the Iron Man technology while also combating his declining health in the, from the arc reactor in his chest. And then you've got Ivan Vanko developing the same technology and built weapons of his own in order to pursue a vendetta against the Stark family. What is this vendetta? Well, And it turns out that you've got Stark's rival, Justin Hammer, faking Vanko's death while breaking him out of prison. It's sad. I mean, I mean, just from the, I mean, just from watching the film, it's a case of they've. Some of it is basically the same as the first Iron Man film, where you've got the. We've got the enemy making weapons that are weapons and armor that are similar to that of Tony's, and you end up having this final battle. I mean, a lot of it felt like a rehash of the first film. But I will give it this: the Monaco Historic Grand Prix. Yes, I'm a motorsport fan. I know praising a motorsport section in a film in a comic book film. I know. I mean, just... <laughs> and it turns out Vanko's intention is to prove to the world that Iron Man is not invincible and in doing so ends up severely damaging his suit in the process but Vanko does commit suicide by blowing up his suit along with the deleted drones
Next up, number 18, we have Age of Ultron. Oh, boy. This, I think, was the weakest of all the Avengers films. Here you've got Tony creating Ultron and after what happens here it just all falls apart and Ultron ends up Ultron ends up having this plan to destroy the world. AI going rogue, in other words. And Jarvis ends up becoming Vision, portrayed par by um, by Paul Bettany. And then, during the film, a few of the Avengers have visions of what could end up happening in the future, foreshadowing events in Infinity War and Endgame. But the scene, though, the scene where everyone's trying to lift Thor's hammer, that's probably the best moment of the film. On top of... The fact that we see the hammer move slightly and Thor's just like, uh-oh. But Cap's just like, nah, I'm good. Can't do it. And then, of course, the post credit scene. Fine. I'll have to do it myself. Thanos gets the Infinity Gauntlet and starts his hunt for the Infinity Stones. Number 17. Captain America the First Avenger. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, my favourite Avenger. <laughs> Set before World War II and the first Marvel Cinematic Universe film canonically in the timeline. The very first, well, first Avenger. Duh, it's in the name. But yeah, great introduction and you've got Chris Evans in here. Last seen in superhero films as Johnny Storm. Or the Human Torch in the Fantastic Four films, and I'm not including 2015 reboot because that was horrifically bad. But what this but what we have here, separate from Lily June World War II, the film tells the story of Steve Rogers, a sickly man from Brooklyn who is transformed into a super soldier and has to stop Red Skull, who intends to use an artifact called the Tesseract as an energy source for world domination. And the Tesseract has The Tesseract is indeed the sp has the space stone in it. And we find out more about these infinity stones 
as the MCU progresses. A great introduction to Steve Rogers, Chris Evans, back in superhero films where he belongs. And you've got Sebastian Stan as Bucky Barnes, or James Buchanan Barnes to give him his full name. And Hayley Atwell as Peggy Carter, who is Captain America's love interest. Agent Carter even got her own spin-off series. I mean, that's brilliant. I mean, a great introduction film to Captain America, but but that's about it. Next up, Ant Man and the Wasp, number sixteen. Goodness me, we're almost halfway through the list already. And, wow. I had just recovered from the end of Infinity War Marvel and you pulled this on me! Here, you've got Paul Rudd, Scott Lang, under house arrest. So, that, which is a good, which does give him a a lot more time to spend with his kids. Well, with, with Cassie. Here, we find out more about the Quantum Realm, which would be a very pivotal part in Avengers Endgame. But why am I talking about the fact that I had just recovered from Infinity War? Because we see the snap effect. Um... Hope, Hope and, hang on, we see this effect, Hope, oh, Van Dyne, hang on a second, yeah, Hope, yeah, I was right, Hope, who becomes the Wasp in this film, after we see a prototype for the wasp suit in the credit scene for the first Ant-Man film. Michael Peña as Louis Lewis. Ah, oh, he is he's brilliant. And he's also he's I mean of course he has the like a caracha, like a caracha, la 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 van. We'll just call the Laka Karacha van. That'll make it easier for me. We've also got Michelle Pfeiffer as Janet Van Dyne. Hope's mum, no less. But again, like I say, I had just recovered from what happened in Infinity War. And then we see the snap happen in a mid credit scene. My exact response. Too soon, Marvel. I just recovered from Infinity War. Number 15. Captain Marvel. Oh, boy. One of the most recent films in the MCU, and the second film in the timeline. There's a lot of nods to the 90s. You've got like Blockbuster, you've got arcade machines. But at the end of Infinity War, we see 
Captain Marvel's symbol on the distress signal that Nick Fury sends before he turns to dust. And yeah. One of the um, the mid credit scene is where you see what's left of the Avengers, and the uh, the signal stops trans transmitting. Captain Marvel shows up. Where's Fury? Oops. Now a lot of fans criticised Brie Larson. For not being very good at the role. But personally, I enjoyed it. Because again, it's, she's another one of those characters where it's a case of... Uh, yeah, I keep getting knocked down, but I always manage to get back up. So next... Uh, I mean, seeing the two hairstyles that uh, Carol Danvers, to give Captain Marvel her actual name, to, uh, seeing the two different hairstyles that Brie Larson has, I prefer her with I prefer her with long hair. That's just me. Let a man have his priorities, guys. Number 14 now, and you've got the first Ant-Man film. Oh, goody. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, I did touch on the... Uh, I did touch on the uh, Ant-Man. I did touch on the, the wasp thing in the, uh, the credit scene. But... Um, what also happened here... This is how you get introduced to Ant-Man. He tries the suit and he's just like, Ah! How does this thing work? Ah! And I think it's definitely one of the, I think it's definitely the funniest introduction to a superhero I've seen. But that's just me. And of course you've got um Sam Falcon making an appearance in this film. Not much else needs to be said beyond that. Number 13, here we go. Go and we are now at now we're now officially now we're at the half. Um, now we're almost at the halfway point. Iron Man now, number 13, the one that started it all. What can be said about this film that hasn't already been said? It's not what we were expecting. Iron Man, not very well known unless you're a diehard Marvel fan. And you had a not very well-known actor in the form of Robert Downey Jr. Uh, probably best known for being in Ally McBeal. And that one scene he got to sing with Sting, though? Oh, well, that was such a great scene in the show. I've lost count of how many times I've actually watched that scene. I mean, who knew Robert Downey Jr.? 
Judy could sing, and sing very well, might I add. Absolutely amazing. Now, like I say, this is the one that started it all. And you got John Favreau, who had directed Elf, and he also directed the live. At, he also directed the Mandalorian. And um, John also ended up having a role in this film as um, as Happy. Some of the other films that John has directed. The live action remakes of The Lion King and The Jungle Book. I'm just at a loss for words. Yeah. Happy Hogan. That's the one. Gwyneth Paltrow as Pepper Potts, who's who ends up becoming Tony Stark's uh, love interest. And then, of course, the first post credit scene in the MCU. I'm here to talk to you about the in Avenger Initiative. Need we say more beyond that? And now we're officially at the halfway point. Number 12. Romanu, I've come to bargain. <laughs> Why waste my time with him? <laughs> time. This is where we see the time stone in action for the first time. Benedict Cumberbatch. As Stephen Strange. And he's playing a doctor, ends up having a career ending car crash. And he ends up learning the mystic arts, thanks to help from uh, Tilda Swinton, no less. Now those who know Benedict Cumberbatch well know him best as Sherlock. Well, Sherlock comes from the... Sherlock TV show on BBC. And the two roles go very hand in hand. But Sherlock, perfectionist, he's like this, 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 and there you go. Case closed. I rest my case. I'm like, it the what? This is pretty much the same case with that, because literally says it right here. I mean, I was literally just talking about it. He compared to the character. He compared the character to the version of Sherlock Holmes that he portrays in Sherlock, calling both characters intelligent and having smatterings of the same colors. And the Time Stone's name is actually called the Eye of Agamotto. And he's also, Strange is also aided by the Cloak of Levitation. Has anyone actually tried Wingardium Leviosa while using the cloak? <laughs> I 
Ah, uh, never mind. Anyway. Here we go. Again, a great introduction to Seeming Strange. It was it was a great way to see him actually get humbled by what happened. And as a result, a very pivotal point in Infinity War. But I'll get to that shortly. Number 11, and it's the first Guardians of the Galaxy film. What can I say about this film soundtrack? Me and some of my friends, we went to see it, and oh my god, it was so much fun. Hey, hey, what's the matter with you? Hey, hey, come and get your love. Chris Pratt as Star Lord. <laughs> Star, st who? Star Lord, man, legendary outlaw. This is just, this is just months after being Emmett Brokowski in the Lego Movie. And then ends up becoming a box office juggernaut with Jurassic World the following year. Zoe Saldana, no stranger to playing aliens. Why? Well, no stranger to sci-fi films because she was part of the Star Trek franchise. The reboots, of course. The ones with Chris Pine and Zachary Quinto. And this is only like the second film we actually see Thanos, but the first time you actually see him like in his true form, he's just like, I mean, Josh Brolin as Thanos, on point. Intimidating doesn't even come close. And you've also got Ronan the Accuser, who's after the Power Stone. Well, mind you, the Guardians are on the same mission. You're mortal! How? Said it yourself. We're the Guardians of the Galaxy. And then... So now we get into the top 10, and I'm going to need to invest a lot more time into this slot. But before that, let's get into the top, the list so far. Number 23, Thor The Dark World. Number 22, Lego, uh, The Incredible Hulk. I'm not sure Lego there. Number 21, Thor. Number 20, Iron Man 3. Number 19, Iron Man 2. Number 18, Age of Ultron. Number 17, The First Avenger. Number 16, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Number 15, Captain Marvel. Number 14, Ant-Man. Number 13, Iron Man. Number 12, Doctor Strange. And number 11, Guardians of the Galaxy. So now, top 10 time. Let's get down to it. Number 10, Spider-Man Far From Home. It wasn't until a few weeks after the film came out that I found out that this was the climax of the Infinity Saga, not Avengers Endgame. I mean...
this is all this is all this all happened before what happened between Sony and Disney regarding the rights to Spider-Man. We thought well, we're not going to get to see Spider-Man in the MCU. But then Tom Holland actually came in, saved the day. Can't remember how he managed it though, but oh, man, this this is a great encore for the Infinity Saga. And you actually have MJ played by Zendaya once again. She is amazing. Fresh off the heels of uh, being um, Anne Wheeler in The Greatest Showman. <laughs> then you've got a mid credit scene where J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson for the Daily Bugle. Oh my word, that was brilliant! I mean, the screen I was in, it was, it was just applause all round. Cheers and applause when he came up onto the screen. I was just like, that is just absolutely brilliant. But then, of course, they're still dealing with the effects of what happened in Endgame, and Infinity War for that matter. They're still trying to wrap their heads around what's happened. The loss of Tony Stark. Natasha Romanov gone on uh, Vormir. And then Steve Rogers living a long, happy life. It's I mean just from the second trailer Peter really misses Tony and so does Happy who's dare I say anything but happy in this film I don't blame him Ryan Gosling no, it's Jake Gyllenhaal, my mistake, flip. Jake Gyllenhaal as Mysterio. Built up so well throughout the film. And in the mid credit scene, reveals the fact that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. And we're just like, what the heck? And I was just like, I now want to see what happens after this. Number nine now. The first Avengers film. Oh, brilliant. Back when crossovers were a rarity in the film genre. I mean... How amazing is this crossover? I mean, I'm at a loss for words here. Like I say, back when crossovers were a rarity in films, and here we are. Now they're all the rage thanks to this um, universe. It's, it's become a world of its own. A lot of memorable moments. We see Thanos for the very first time. The great interactions that Loki has with Iron Man. We have an army. We have a Hulk.
And then, of course, that shot of just panning round all six of them. Just, wow. And Hulk. <clears throat> smash. <laughs> it's just that big grin that just sums it up. Number eight, Wakanda Forever. Of course, it's Black Panther. First superhero film to receive a nomination for Best Picture at the Oscars. I mean, that in itself shows how great this film is. Why? It wasn't afraid to get political. And people compared it to The Lion King, which is interesting. But looking back on it, you can do, you can definitely see the similarities. I mean, Michael B. Jordan, fresh off um, filming for Creed and Creed 2, plays Killmonger here. And after besting, after besting T'Challa, ends up becoming the new Black Panther. And... It is just brilliant. And then you've got one of uh, T'Challa's helpers. End up referencing a meme. What are those? I mean, need we say more beyond that? Ah, oh, man. And then we see a small cameo from Bucky Barnes. They actually give him a vibranium arm. Which you see him put into action for Infinity War. Number seven, Thor Ragnarok. And we're back to Thor. And oh my god, this is so much better than the previous two Thor films. Definitely the best in the trilogy. He's actually getting a fourth film uh, in the next couple of years. What were the odds? People are annoyed that Hawkeye didn't get his own solo movie. But... Loki's back. Again. How does he keep coming back from the dead? Beats me, but whatever the case... You have Thor's sister coming into the fray, feeling like she was betrayed uh, by not being allowed to take the throne. But it turns out, it turns out, uh, Hela. is trying to commence the inevitable Ragnarok, hence the, hence the title. Hulk, for once in your life, please don't smash, but big monster! <laughs> Did I also forget to mention that um, Hulk makes an appearance here? And... When Thor sees him for the first time, he's just like, Yes! Unbelievable. Hela is played brilliantly by Kate Blanchett. And 
then after uh, Mjolnir gets destroyed by Hela, Thor has to harness the power of lightning without the hammer. All while listening to the immigration song. Number six, Spider-Man Homecoming. Now, this isn't Spider-Man's first appearance in the MCU at this point. It was actually his second. What was his first? We'll get to that very shortly. Oh boy! Spider-Man's first solo film in the MCU. And Tom Holland... I think a lot of people can agree that he is the best portrayal of both sides of Spider-Man. Tobey Maguire captured Peter Parker very well. Andrew Garfield, his Spider-Man, much closer to the comics. They couldn't quite get the other side of the coin though. Tom Holland gets both sides of the coin and the rest. Not to mention the fact they actually managed to recreate one of the most iconic shots in comic book history in this film. That, for me, helps propel it so far up the list. Michael Keaton, as well, might I add, as the Vulture. Wow! And then it's just the look... And then it's before the homecoming dance. It's the look on Peter's face when he sees that his love interest, her father, turns out to be Michael Keaton. And he's just like... I mean, and then you've got Ned, Pete's best friend. I mean, just, wow. The on-screen chemistry is just amazing. So now we are into the top five. Oh boy. The top five. Captain America once again, and it's the Winter Soldier. So here we go. Why is this just why is this just making it into the top five? A lot of that is down to the speech that he makes in the film that convinced me to side with Captain America Team Cap. For our number four entry, Civil War. This is what Batman vs. Superman should have been. But it wasn't. But like I said, this is what Batman vs. Superman should have been. High stakes, very personal. It does have its comedic moments. But who can forget about Mission Report, December 16, 1990. Blah! Can't get those out. Mission Report, December 16, 1991. How amazing... Civil War is as far as the stakes are concerned. And it's the incident that just basically tears the Avengers apart. Why? Because of the Sokovia Accord. Sokovia Accords. After the events that take place in Age of Ultron and then an accident in Africa and this is where we get introduced to Black Panther and Spider-Man <laughs> All right. I've had enough to I've had enough of this. I'm the Roose! <laughs> and oh my word, Spider-Man suit looks amazing! So like I said, this was this was when we got introduced to Black Panther for the first time. His father gets killed at a United Nations meeting of some sort, 
and it's just amazing to see how well it was all put together. So now we're into the top three. We still have two Avengers films and the Guardians of the Galaxy. Number three, Avengers Infinity War. A lot of people have put this one as number one and it's easy to see why. It summarizes what's been happening throughout the last 10 years of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. For those that haven't been able to watch all of the films up to that up to this point. And uh, Thanos said it himself. No resurrections this time. Meaning those that are gonna meaning those that are going to be dead, stay dead. It's just... You want to talk about high stakes? They're trying to stop... The Avengers are trying to stop Thanos from... snapping his fingers and wiping out 50% of the universe. Do they succeed? That's what. Well, of course they don't. That's why they. That's why it set up Avengers Endgame so well. One of the rare occasions where the villain actually succeeds. I mean, the original plan was to have Infinity War stop at the snap. And just leave the audience to fill in the blanks until Endgame came out the following year. But nope. We see the aftermath of the snap. Barnes gone. Wanda gone. Mantis gone. Drax gone. Groot gone again. Star-Lord gone. Strange gone. Falcon gone. Black Panther gone. And the worst one of all, Spider-Man, gone. I mean, I was just like, oh, don't do this to me! And... I mean, Nebula said it herself. He did it. And Vision gets killed as well at this point. The Mind Stone ripped out of him by Thanos to complete the gauntlet. You should have gone for the head. Talk about game changing. Number two, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Now, this prior to Endgame coming out was my favourite MCU film. Because a lot of it was music I was very familiar with, especially The Chain by Fleetwood Mac. Used quite a bit in the marketing. Kurt Russell as... Ego, Star Lord's biological father. It's not my heart to put that too near her head. Dolly zoom onto Star Lord. What? And then Star Lord is just like pew 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 pew. That reveal, I was legitimately like, what? And, I mean, 
Star Lord's reactions were pretty much on point. You killed my mother! To find and then ego the find the best form that's the form that best suited you transforming into David Hasselhoff at this point. And this is the thanks that I get And then it's like, and then it's like That's my freaking father Yondu and Mary Poppins, y'all <laughs> Oh what a scene that is. Uh, I, but I'd like to say the chain by Fleetwood Mac. That was amazing. And Baby Groot is so freaking cute. I am Groot. Mm -hmm. I am Groot. Mm -hmm. I am Groot. No, that's the same one you pointed at last time. Oh boy. What an amazing, I mean, what an amazing film. But not quite my number one. What is my number one? Well, this is it. This is where we find out. Before that, we get a recap of my list. We get a recap of the list. Number 23, Thor The Dark World. Number 22, The Incredible Hulk. Number 21, Thor. Number 20, Iron Man 3. Number 19, Iron Man 2. Number 18, Avengers Age of Ultron. Number 17, Captain America the First Avenger. Number 16, Ant-Man and the Wasp. Number 15, Captain Marvel. Number 14, Ant-Man. Number 13, Iron Man. Number 12, Doctor Strange. Number 11, Guardians of the Galaxy. Number 10, Spider-Man Far From Home. Number 9, The Avengers. Number 8, Black Panther. Number 7, Thor Ragnarok. Number 6, Spider-Man Homecoming. Number 5, Captain America Winter Soldier. Number 4, Captain America Civil War. Number 3, Avengers Infinity War. And number 2, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Which then leaves... Number 1, Avengers Endgame. Now, I went into a fair bit of detail in my uh, spoiler-free review, which you can see on my channel. But, because I'm not, because I'm not, uh, because I have no restrictions on spoilers for this video. The portal scene where you see everyone coming back. Black Panther, Falcon, the Guardians. Doctor Strange, Spider-Man. It's just such an iconic moment in storytelling. Once in a generation, you have what that one moment in cinema that defines storytelling. For me, this was it. Captain America lifting Mjolnir. So many callbacks to previous Avengers films, even The Dark World, which uh, fans were not a fan of. That is America's ass, though. <laughs> I mean, Professor Hulk, I mean, the body of Hulk with the brain of Bruce Banner. I see this as an absolute win! But in the first act... Thanos' head getting chopped off. What did you do? I went for the head. I mean, we just, and I was just like, so what's going to happen now? Because they put, I mean, Marvel put in so much money for the marketing that they didn't tell us. They didn't tell us whether the superheroes were going to be back or not. And with the Quantum Realm suit, that's how I got this. 35 quid each. I got one for one of my friends who was going to be with me. Sadly couldn't make it due to time constraints. So here I am on my lonesome. But nevertheless, I've persevered. I've pulled through. 
hour and 15 minutes later, here we are. So, <clears throat> I will say this though, fans did criticise the film for being overloaded with fan service. But I saw that as a good thing. Why? Because it helped give those that hadn't been there from the start the chance to be the, to be able to see what these other films were like. Encouraging them to go back and watch the 21 before it and then watch Spider-Man Far From Home afterwards. Tony's death is still fresh in people's minds. But he saved the day. It was for all those reasons that Avengers Endgame is my favourite film in the Infinity Saga. And that is it. What's going to happen now is I'm going to sign off. And I'm going to put together a retrospective of 2019 showcasing some of my favourite moments throughout this year. Not necessarily on my channel but from the events and places that I've been to over the course of the year. It's been a tough year for me, dealing with the loss of my gran, mental health issues, among other things. But nevertheless, I persevered, I pulled through, and here we are. I've learned that it's okay to not be okay. I've learned that I can face my fears. And there's nothing wrong with being myself. There's nothing wrong with being who I am. Thank you guys so much for being there for me. And also thank you for helping me hit my first big milestone. At time of recording, I'm at 115 subscribers. <clears throat> I'm, 100, I'm at 115 right now. Can we hit 200 next year? Fingers crossed we can. But what's going to be happening as far as... <clears throat> what's going to be happening as far as uh, next year on my channel is concerned? Well, you'll need to tune into the start of my retrospective to find out. But until then, hope you guys enjoyed what you saw. If you did, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to keep up to date with what I do on this channel, hit the subscribe button, click the bell, turn on all notifications so you don't miss anything I do on this channel. Previous video on the left where it's uh, me and James putting together our 25 favourite PlayStation games of all time with this year marking 25 years of PlayStation. And on the right, we've got... Uh, we've got my um, we've got we've got my top tens playlist. I'll be doing a few more top tens over the course of next year. But I guess I'll say you'll need to tune in to find out about all that. And so, with that in mind, thank you so thank you so much for watching, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day, peace out, and as always, stay faithful.